Well, guys, if you're watching this and you watched the end of that last lecture, you know that I said we're not going to let this thing win, but it, it won. It definitely won. So uh, feel free to disregard the last three or so minutes of last lecture when I was battling um, technological issues. Um, tech issues seem to be the name of the game this semester, so we're just going to do the best we can. I'm, uh, I'm trying to uh, yeah, do the best I can. So model-based geostatistics, we just wrote down this model. I'm a little scared to use this stylus now, but we're going to have to give it a shot. So this is the marginal model. You will notice that we have no spatial effect omega there. So we just model the mean and we model variability around the mean. So the mean is right there. And the variability around the mean that is allowed to be spatially correlated as a function of our spatial correlation function. Now, the major drawback to this that we were discussing was that by far most distributions don't have a variance covariance slot in that distribution. So how do we do it? Well, we can think of this in a multi-level sense. Um, the formally, this is called the conditional model. That's when you take a two-step approach. And think of it as a two-step approach where you first model the spatial effects and then you plug them in and model the uh, process for the data, right? So this, what you actually observe is the data, not the spatial effects, but you break your modeling exercise into two steps. So first, we model just the spatial effects. You will notice that, that this process is mean zero. And you will notice that there isn't a nugget here. Right? There's no nugget. Okay, because we're only modeling the, modeling the pure spatially structured component. But then we modify the means with these estimates right here. And we introduce, just think of it as measurement error. So everything's structure, spatially structured, modify the mean, and add some random measurement error around it. That is the conditional approach or multi-level approach, if you will. So the benefits to this, the major benefit is we can use distributions that are not normal. In level one, all we have to do is plug these spatial effects into the mean of any distribution, and we're going to have a spatially correlated outcome. We can model a spatially correlated outcome. The drawbacks to this, we don't observe. our outcome conditional on the spatial effects. We observe why, not why conditional on this latent spatial special sauce, if you will. So, you know, it's formally, you should question what we're modeling here. Because what we observe is more consistent with this model characterization, where, you know, we observe why and we model why. But in this conditional model characterization, we don't observe this quantity ever. It's just a modeling tool. So as a preview, you will notice that this level hasn't changed. 
right? Here are our latent spatial effects. A linear combination of everything that is not in the mean. And then we take our spatial effect and we modify the mean of the Poisson distribution. Now, this is key because the Poisson distribution does not have a variance covariance term. It only depends on the mean, the Poisson distribution does. So we first model our spatial component and then we incorporate it directly into the mean. And so we were basically um, the means are correlated. That is different than saying the data is correlated, right? Because here the means are correlated. Okay, we'll see more examples of these non-normal spatial models later in the course. Now let's just for a few minutes begin talking about spatial correlation functions. Now this section, I admit, can be a bit dry because it's kind of like going to the zoo where oh, there's that animal, there's this animal, there's that animal doing this. Um, I feel like I, I want to show you uh, a few important ones because they are a part of any spatial model. So all of these spatial effects will have this kind of form. It'll be a function of the distance matrix H and theta will be a set of parameters that control how quickly correlation decays as a function of distance. These will be either one or two parameters. Um, I, don't remember, I don't think we will ever get to if there's three parameters. So the other difficulty is that these parameters, these spatial correlation parameters, can be tough to interpret directly, very difficult to interpret directly. So sometimes you will see this referred to as a range parameter but do not confuse that with the range. So range parameter is not the range. The range parameter is a parameter inside the correlation function. The range is the distance where spatial correlation goes to zero. One, it will be a function of the other, but they're not the same, so don't confuse them. The other difficulty is that um, some of the more, uh, most popular or most common um, spatial correlation functions will depend on a second parameter. And so, you know, for us to think about the range, we will need to really compute it at any one of the, of the, <laughs> Covariance terms is not readily interpreted. I think I'll just, I'll just say that. Let's just get into an example. Let's go to the zoo. Let's go to the zoo. Okay. One of the most popular spatial correlation functions is called the exponential. Not the exponential distribution, but this is the exponential spatial correlation function. So for any two observations, Right? We have the correlation as a function of the distance, and here is our function, e to the negative phi times the distance. The covariance is just our correlation function times the variance. So let's take a look at this plot. We have correlation on the y-axis, we have distance on the x-axis. So it's clear that as phi increases, yeah, as phi increases, the range decreases. Look at the blue curve and the orange curve. For the blue curve, the range is 4. For the orange curve, the range is somewhere, you know, below 1. For the green curve, the range occurs, you know, it's greater than six, it's greater than the distance that I have up in the, on the plot. The other way to do it, I generated some data with our three different phi values and I plotted them right here 
um, as a function of just a single um, coordinate. So this can easily show us how rough the surface is. If you were gonna take a bike and ride it along the green surface, the blue surface, or the orange surface, you would probably pick the green surface. So as phi increases, or call it decreases, as phi decreases, it becomes a smoother process. So, smaller phi, more spatial correlation, a greater degree of spatial structure in the data. In a bout of frustration, this is not the only way you will see the exponential correlation function written. You will also see this in some books, in some articles, in some blogs. You will also see the spatial correlation function written like this. So clearly, if depending on how it's written, as negative phi times something or negative one over phi times something, these identities are going to flip. The other way it's written, and it will become clear to us why next time, sometimes it will have a three in there. And again, you know, these plots are going to be different if I have a three in there as opposed to just phi in there. But in a lot of books, the exponential correlation function looks just like that. If it is written like that, as phi increases, the range decreases. As phi decreases, the, the process becomes smoother clear by looking at the green line. In two dimensions, right, when phi is small, we have really evident spatial correlation. When phi becomes large, it becomes kind of hard to differentiate. In the end, these don't look that different to me. Yes, 0.25 looks totally different than either one or four, but one and four, not much to separate. Not much to differentiate. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, cut differentiate off as diff. Okay. And of course, with 0.25, this looks like a smoother process. Than either one of these. Take a look at another one. Gaussian spatial correlation function. Looks very similar to the exponential, but now we have this squared term here. The phi parameter, smaller, larger, smaller phi, larger range. But again, phi is not the range. Phi is not the range. Right? The range for the green line is bigger than the range for the orange line. As far as smoothness, you, will, you can see this is much smoother than the exponential. In fact, when we look at it in two dimensions, it turns out that the Gaussian is often too smooth. It's often too smooth to use in most applications, to be honest. That's why you will see the exponential correlation function used more often. It just produces too smooth a process. And again, notice that 0.25 is totally different than one or four, but one and four are quite similar. And this speaks to the fact that these um, 
covariance parameters, these range parameters are quite difficult to estimate. Because, you know, just visually, you know, how can you tell between one and four? That's a fourfold difference. Okay? Quite similar, but now we have two terms in there. We have P the power, and we have phi the um, range parameter. So phi, similar interpretation to before. And this P power parameter, it basically um, chooses between if, you know, we don't have to choose to go exponential or Gaussian, we can just model that power as its own parameter. So it helps us choose something between exponential and Gaussian. To be honest, not very common. Uh, this one is not very common and it can be quite difficult to differentiate between processes that are produced, you know, at different power parameters. Yes, one spatial correlation is strong, that looks completely different than the others. But the other three plots are quite similar. There's just not that much information to estimate those terms. Spherical. Well, spherical is maybe one that should be a favorite. Uh, it, it's not used very often but more often than either the Gaussian or the power exponential. One over phi is actually the range. If you're using the spherical correlation function, you estimate phi, one over phi will actually be the range. Look, when in the green line, phi is 0.25, Right, one over phi is four. That is exactly where that line hits zero. That correlation hits zero. Orange line, phi is four. I can tell you where that line hits exactly zero is 0.25. When phi is one, where that correlation line hits zero is exactly one. That is maybe a reason to use the spherical correlation function. It uh, appears in almost every single or every single uh, R package for um, spatial statistics. Again, similar concept. Strong spatial correlation looks different, but when we start to get weaker, right, phi equals one and phi equals four um, constitute fairly weak spatial correlation. It becomes hard to differentiate, hard to estimate. Moving on. Make turn. So, of course, there's not going to be a test we have to memorize them. Nobody memorizes these uh, spatial correlation functions, but I want you to get a sense of what they look like. May turn is another one that is quite popular. Uh, it has two parameters, the phi parameter that controls uh, the degree of spatial dependence, new parameter, all right, let's write that, degree of spatial dependence. New parameter is the smoothness parameter. And you can see on the bottom of this slide how they affect what, what that line looks like. Same concept. If you have strong spatial correlation, you will have more information to estimate these things. Most often, we fix new at a value. And in fact, when new equals one, we retain the exponential correlation function. And when nu is goes to infinity, so as our may turn becomes infinitely smooth, our may turn approaches the Gaussian. You know what? This thing has won today because we have looked at a number of these spatial correlation functions. We have a couple of more, uh, maybe the most interesting ones are coming up. So on that cliffhanger, I will call it quits for today. 
Um, I will see you guys next time. Thank you for putting up with the tech issues. Um, I hope you guys are well. Um, take care. I'll see you soon.